I actually started working on this video yesterday, January 26, 2021, the Feast of Epiphany. And as I was working on that video, I started getting news reports about how the very foundations of our democracy were being attacked and the symbols of our national government were being overrun and ransacked. And it just really shook me to the core. I don't know about you, but watching the events of yesterday unfold just really seemed to suck the air out of my life. It's been very hard for me to concentrate on this video on the history of the Magi and my second video in the Epiphany series. The other thing I hope is that for those of you who view this video six months, a year, or even longer from that from now, I really hope and pray that our nation has really healed and come to a reconciliation over this horrible event. Having said all that, I hope you have a good cup of coffee to kind of cheer you up and make you feel good because we're going to dive into the history of the interpretation of the Magi. This is the second video on Epiphany. So let's dive in. The adoration of the Magi is an impressive story, even though it's incredibly short. We have strangers guided by a mysterious sign in the heavens traveling across a vast expanse from a distant land. There's intrigue within the palace. There is threat to the newborn baby's life, and we have angelic visitations. Even though the story of the Magi is only 12 verses long, it contains an impressive amount of literary features and devices. Now, before I go any further, I just want to say that in my book, Reading the Bible with the Giants, how 2,000 years of biblical interpretation can shed new light on old texts, I've got an entire chapter that explains how to trace the history of a text interpretation, chapter five. And then at the very back, I've got an appendix that will take you to all sorts of resources so that you can do these types of studies if you're interested. Now, as we go through this study on the history of how the Magi have been interpreted, I've got two goals. A, to show you the history of how it's been interpreted, but also B, how the biblical text and previous interpretations then impact how we read and, and interpret the text today. Now the story of the Magi really reveals a great deal to us because we are told so little in the story. All that Matthew tells us is that Magi from the East came because they saw a sign in the heavens and they came to worship Christ and they brought with them gold, frankincense, and myrrh. What's interesting in this story is that we don't even know how many magi there were. We fill in a gap there because there were three gifts. We immediately assume that each one brought their own gift. And so there were three magi. But that's a gap that we fill in in the story. And the history of interpretation reveals to us how interpreters down through church history have attempted to fill in that gap regarding who were the magi. Because even the use of that term magi is rather nondescript within the ancient world. The first trajectory of interpretation that I want to cover is that of salvation history. But let's start with the second secretary ID. Justin Martyr saw the story of the Magi as an example of pagans who worshipped false religions, renouncing that to follow a true belief in Christ. Shortly after him, Clement of Alexandria took the same line of interpretation. And then a little bit later on, Tertullian, following Justin Martin's lead, filled it out a little bit more and said that they were turning from a worship of astrology to the worship of Christ. And he saw that the star led them to where Christ was as an example of this. They were following the true light now. In the text of Matthew chapter 2, when the Magi approach Herod, they said, where is the one born king of the Jews? For we saw his star when it rose and we have come to worship him. And then a little bit further down in the text in verse 11, it says, when they came to the house and saw the child and Mary his mother, they bowed down and worshiped him. And the Greek verb there for worship is proskuneo. It talks about prostrating yourself on the ground or kneeling before someone higher. So the early church fathers, when they interpreted this passage and they saw this verb, they really read this as an indication that these magi have turned from their false religions to the true faith in Christ. John Chrysostom, who comes along in the fourth century, 
develops this a little bit further and he says that these are examples of people who have an inner enlightenment that lead them to the true knowledge of God. Chrysostom writes in his homily on Matthew 6, 4 that, For since he who came was to put an end to the ancient polity, and to call the world to the worship of himself, and to be worshipped in all land and sea, straightway from the beginning he opens the door to the Gentiles, willing through strangers to admonish his own people. Thus, because the prophets were continually heard speaking of his advent, and they gave no great heed, he made even barbarians come from a far country to seek after the king that was among them. In line with this, the early church fathers also interpreted the three gifts theologically as well. Gold, frankincense, and myrrh were then seen through a theological prism. Gold to represent their recognition as Christ as the King of Kings, Lord of Lords, and then the frankincense and mare for preparation of his burial. And take note how many of you have heard this same teaching all the way down to this day, even though there's no indication of that in the text. They just brought three gifts to Christ. Probably in all reality, they brought these three because they were portable. In other words, you could pack a lot of wealth into a little bit of gold. So it makes a great gift to transport over a long distance to give to someone who you think is very important. The same with frankincense and myrrh. Now, one of the earliest depictions of this is off a stone sarcophagus in the church of St. Agnes in Rome. And I'm just going to detour here for a moment because I want to tell you about a book. And that's The Geometry of Love by Margaret Weiser. Now, she is a food critic. And here she's writing this book on the church of St. Agnes in Rome. And when a student of mine first turned me on to this book, I thought, yeah, right. What is a food critic going to have to tell us about the history of a Roman church? Well, this book knocks it out of the park. It's excellent, it's very detailed, and she really helps you understand why a chalice is called a chalice and it's shaped the way it is. Symbolism within the church. Well worth a read when you have time. Oh yes, back to the stone sarcophagus. On this sarcophagus, we can see how the three wise men are depicted here, and each one is bringing his own gift, and then we have them pointing to the star, a great example of this salvation history line of interpretation of the Magi is seen in this fresco from a monastery in Bulgaria. The identification of the Magi here is really linked up with prophecies in Isaiah 60, Psalm 72, and Psalm 68. Now notice, they're not really depicted as kings per se, according to the European tradition, but they're depicted as sort of wise men, sages, or wealthy court officials from the East. The second line of interpretation that I want to cover is what I call political interpretations. And these really develop after 313 AD, when Constantine becomes emperor of the Roman Empire and makes Christianity the official religion. Persecution of the church prior to that was sporadic and it really depended on who sat on the throne in Rome and the local governors that you were under. It wasn't universal all the time in all places. The key thing is, with Constantine ascending to the throne, the relationship between the church and the empire takes a radical shift. And the early church fathers really saw the empire coming to Christ as an indication or a fulfillment of the Gentiles now being incorporated in the church but on a much wider and grander scale. The iconography shifts at this point in time. Now the Magi are no longer represented as just sort of people from the East coming to worship Christ. Now they are depicted as kings or royalty. As a result, it portrays this larger story that's taking place within the church, within the Roman Empire, that now the royalty or the rulers are coming to Christ as well. The corollary message to it, that if the rulers are coming to Christ to worship him, then as a result, they now have the authority to rule because they stand under Christ's authority. By 500 AD, almost all the commentators adopt this prevalent view represented within the iconography that the Magi were members of the royal household from some kingdom east of 
Israel. When the Reformation hits, a lot of this will get dropped because with the Reformation, not only do you have a Reformation of the Church, but you have a lot of political battles taking place at the same time. Northern Europe becomes viciously anti-Catholic. Within certain regions of France and Spain, you have persecution of the Protestants. And so the relationship between the church and the state is questioned during the Reformation. And as a result, a lot of the interpreters no longer look at the story of the Magi as kings coming to worship Christ. Prior to Constantine in this shift, the church really tended to see the wise men as pagans converting to Christianity. There was nothing special about them. They brought expensive gifts, yes, but there is nothing really particularly special about them. After Constantine, and we see this royal or this political interpretation of them, now that changes. What is important for us today, and what really struck me with the events of yesterday, is how once the Magi are portrayed as kings, this story then gets co-opted to support the ruling authorities and powers during their day. In San Vitale in Ravenna, Italy, this iconography of the Magi as kings is clearly on display. This church was built around 500 and paid for by the Empress Theodora. And she's the one in the middle with sort of the brown robe on there or the brown cloak on. Now, if we zoom in at the bottom of her cloak there, we see the three wise men embroidered into her garment. And so this depicts that not only do the Magi come to Christ, but just like them, Theodora is an empress who worships Christ, but also is given the right to rule because of that. And so we see this relationship between how the text is interpreted and the affiliation or the backing of the church behind those authorities. And we need to be very careful anytime we see any sort of political co-opting of a biblical text or a Christian truth for political means and gains. Another example is the window at Canterbury Cathedral, which was done around the 12th century. We can see the, these panes, which depict sort of three scenes from the story of the Magi. In the first, or the top pane, we see them following the star to come and worship Christ. In the second pane, just below that, we see them approaching King Herod and asking him where this king to be born is at. The third pain, we see them approaching Mary and Jesus and offering their gifts to him. And then in the fourth, we have the angel warning the wise men in a dream not to go back and to tell Herod. But notice they're depicted with crowns on their head. And that's important because during the 12th and the 13th century, England was ruled by kings. So by depicting the Magi as kings who worship Christ, you have a transfer of this idea to the royal families and houses of England. They worship Christ also, therefore they have legitimacy to rule over the land. During the Reformation, one of the really interesting things is how Botticelli picks up upon this. In the Adoration of the Magi, Botticelli does not depict the Magi as kings, but he puts his own particular twist on the story as he does in so many of his artworks. In this case, the three wise men are now depicted as members of the ruling Medici family. In his artwork, it is not so much giving authority to rule to the royalty, but now it is being transferred to these wealthy merchants within his city. Alongside this political reading, we also have the development of an interpretation that I'm going to call geographical readings. An origin who writes and lives around 250 AD is the one who really starts this line of interpretation. Origen is the first interpreter to tell us that there were three magi. And he not only tells us that, but he tells us their names. Their names are Caspar, Melchior, and Balthasar. We also see that depicted and picked up in a mosaic at San Apollinaire in Italy. One of the things to realize is that as he incorporates the three names, Caspar, Melchior, and Balsasar, it doesn't just end there. He sets a trajectory of interpretation in line that others are going to develop further from there. So, for example, Caspar is described as a young man without a beard, and Melchior is described as a very fine elderly gentleman with a very godly gray beard. <laughs> 
and Balsasar is often represented as a middle-aged man. So we've got three ages, Casper the young man, Balsasar the middle-aged man, and then Melchior the older man. And then within that, Balsasar begins to be depicted as someone from Africa. Where does all this come from? Well, Justin Martyr takes the text where it says they came from the east, and he thinks that they came from Saudi Arabia. Clement of Alexandria, working off him, says, well, no, that's not far enough. They have to come from Persia. By the time we reach the great church historian and theologian Bede, now he says that the three men not only represent the young, middle-aged, and old, but they also came from Asia, Africa, and Europe. So we've got three ages and three geographic representations within these three people. And notice how these trajectories just start developing slowly over time. Here's an exercise that you can do. Go back and take a look at the little figurines or depictions that you see of wise men and see if you can locate what type of reading is represented in that art. Does it show three wise men from the east? Does it show the royal line of interpretation? Does it show the three ages of man? Or are the three different geographical regions, Asia, Europe, and Africa, represented in that reading as well? How do your figures of the wise men represent these different trajectories of interpretation? You can put that in the comments down below. I'd love to hear it, and it's a great exercise to explore. A great representation of how these three traditions, age, geography, and royalty, all get amalgamated together is in this window at Cologne Cathedral in Germany. This window is from around 1500. And notice how the three wise men are depicted with royal robes. We have the three ages and we have the three races represented as well here. The Adoration of the Magi by Mantena around 1480 really portrays these three races and ages in this one artwork. We see Melchior, Balsasior, and Casper all worshiping there, being represented by the young, the middle-aged, and the old, and the three races. Now, I mentioned earlier that with the Reformation, that the wise men begin to be interpreted no longer as members of the royalty or kings. Now we have a different perspective being taken on them. Instead, they're seen as wise men. Now, there's two things that go along with this. First off, they go back and they perhaps pick up the earliest reading from Justin Martyr and Clement that these were people from the East. But instead of seeing them as people who worship a pagan religion, now they see them as wise men. Well, why do they do that? Remember, while the Reformation is taking place, you also have the Renaissance. And this wise man, this learned man, the Renaissance man is really coming to the forefront as someone to be emulated and followed. So the wise men now get interpreted within that light or that prism. This reading really kind of started in the medieval period, but it took off during the Reformation and afterwards. James Tissot's artwork, The Magi Journey, which is in the Brooklyn Museum, is a great example of this. They are not depicted as kings. They're not depicted as royalty. They are depicted as very wise people from the East on this caravan journeying to worship the newborn king. I hope you enjoyed this very, very fast survey that I've taken here of the history of how the Magi have been interpreted and depicted through the ages. I also hope it helps you to see how that history of interpretation shapes and informs how you read and understand the text as well. And then finally, give it a thumbs up or leave some comments down below. Be sure to check out my other video up here, my first in the series on Epiphany. I'm going to have another video coming up on the flight into Egypt, which developed off this story, especially Matthew 2.13 coming up. Until then, peace.